So you can tell this is going to be a long one. We have the longest title that we've ever had, standardization with modeling slash the parametric G formula, as well as we already have a lot on our plates. We have, we, have a, we have a lot of stuff here. Okay, so let's get started. So as we talked about before, standardization has some problems. So for example, if we have an L value that is continuous, as we might have here, we can't necessarily standardize. This is because there are infinite combinations that this L value can have. And we're not guaranteed, even though we might have some examples, of having positivity. So this 0.4 example, we might only have one person that has an L value of 0.4 that has been treated. Okay, so let's dig right in uh, and then talk about how we'll solve this problem. So for example, we can go back to our original, original goodie. So we've got a doctor. So we are, we are interested in whether going to a doctor helps or not. Um, in this case, we have an L value, which will be some normalized value of white blood cell count, uh, and this will be L. Uh, we will be interested in the population of the USA. Okay, and so again, this, this is a little person in a, in a circle. We will be interested in the outcome of number of days sick. So number of days sick, this will be Y, and we will be interested in of course, the average causal effect. We'll be interested in the average causal effect in the population, even though we can't standardize. So what do we do? So the average causal effect is always we write this by uh, y sub a minus not a. This for the entire population. Okay, so we talked about something last time. We talked about modeling last time. So what did modeling entail? So modeling necessitated us to have a sample of the population with some values. So a sample, which we generally write the sample as a little person without a bubble of the population, with some number of values, some number of values in. So can we use modeling necessarily to help us out with finding out what the average causal effect is? Maybe, but first we need to know whether we have a sample. And the answer to as to whether we have a sample is, well, of course we do. We simply take our values that we have right here, treated, non-treated, the value of white blood cell count, and then the value of the actual outcome, the value of Y, and we feed them to our sample. Once we have our sample, we can use our sample and feed its input into a model. And the model that we talked about last time was linear regression. Linear regression. Once we have linear regression, we have some function of both the treatment as well as the confounder that will give us a value y. Now I wanna, I wanna talk about this just for a moment. So we can do prediction. The only thing we need for prediction is to have a random sample. So let, let me go ahead and put rand up here just so we know, is to have a good random sample. So in this case, we can do a prediction pass of linear regression with a good random sample. So why are we interested in causal inference in the first place? Well, once again, we might be interested from a policy perspective of whether or not to go see the doctor or not. So maybe you can predict that people that go to the doctor are sicker. That doesn't necessarily mean that doctors make people sick. This is the fundamental problem of causal inference. This is the stuff that we talked about right from the beginning with selection bias. So prediction is one thing. It is great. It's used in tons of machine learning models, and it's probably used all over the internet. That being said, causal inference is something very different and something that's also very important. So now we've got linear regression. We have some sort of prediction of each y hat. What can we do with this? Well, we talked about last time we weren't able to necessarily weight each L appropriately. And this was because each L might not have positivity. So there might not be both an A and not A in the subset. In addition, we didn't necessarily know what the, uh, what the frequency of each L was in the population, since we might only get it once or twice. So we asked our question around this idea of, okay, we'll, we'll do something very similar to last time. We will go ahead and use L in order to make small uh, mini populations. And inside these mini populations, we'll go ahead and compute the average causal effect. And then we'll take a weighted sum of the mini populations up in order to figure out what the average causal effect is for the population. However, there's something else that we can do entirely. And this is really quite clever. We can actually use the data as itself as a representative of the full population. Okay, but we run into the problem once again of the fundamental problem of causal inference. 
If we use the data just as the full population itself, how am I to compare what some individual would have gotten if they did not go to the doctor? Or if they did go to the doctor? We run into, again, the fundamental problem of causal inference. So for those that are, are a little bit prescient uh, or super clever, you might, already, you might already see the answer. In fact, we can predict what these values might be. We can take the values L and A for someone that did go to the doctor. So in this case, their value of L is 0.03 and their value of doctor is one. We can flip the value of doctor to be zero and we can predict using our function what their outcome would have been. Okay, so let me go ahead and write this on the right just to be very, very concrete. So we go ahead and we get now new values which I'll call A hat and not A hat. Um, and you know what? Just to give these like a little bit more significance here, I'm going to go ahead and put them in purple. So we've got a hat, and then we have not a hat. These values we get by either one, taking the values that we got from our population. So over here, we already had a, so we already had this value of this uh, particular individual as a treated individual. And we go ahead and we predict what his or her value would have been using our model. So perhaps we get a three. So again, we take, so this three over here gives a three here, and then we can go ahead and we fit what we would have done in our model. And we can continue on with this exact procedure for the entire data set. So we continue on for this exact procedure for the entire data set. So we get seven and five, are these the actual true values? And then we might get something along the lines of five and two. Okay, so we have all these values. What do we do? Well, at this point, you should be able to tell me. We actually have, ta-da, the unit level causal effect for every single individual in our population. Wow. And based on these unit level causal effects, we can really quite easily compute not only what the average causal effect is, but what the average effect would be if everyone in the treatment, if everyone in the population were treated and everyone in the population were not treated. So we can pretty easily compute both y, again, I can put a little y hat up here because this is an estimated parameter, sub a, as well as y hat sub not a. Pretty cool. Simply, we'd take the difference between these two and we'd splat it into our formula over here to give us the actual average causal effect. Okay, so I hope you followed along with this. This was obviously one of the most complex uh, lessons that we've done so far. If you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and put them down in the comment section. I will be happy to answer them. But this is the procedure we will generally use. Notice what we've done, just one final time here. We've gone ahead and we have estimated the causal effects, but we have assumed, we have used the population, we've used the sample of individuals that we've gotten to assume what their relative weights of these causal effects should be in the population. So this is one way to do it. There are other ways to do it as well.